Hey everybody, it's a Game Boy. Hey. It's uh, me, Digibro, with Hippocrit. We talk about game consoles one at a time, and this time we're talking about one that uh, I think is going to be your area of expertise and not so much mine, the PlayStation 1. Yes, uh, PlayStation 1, I didn't actually grow up with it that much, but it is, I have, ha I did have it as a kid, but I only had like five or six games for it, so like the big classics mm. that everyone remembers, like Final Fantasy 7 and stuff, didn't have those. Um, but okay. uh, I, I do have a lot to say about the way the, co the the aesthetic of the games on the console and a lot of the the, the big ones. Yeah, I'm going to be very curious to hear you talk particularly about the aesthetic because it's quite different from the N64 as well as the consoles, you know, the next console generation. Um, to start with some history for this console, this happened when uh, Nintendo fucked up so badly that Sony took over the world. Um, essentially, yeah. Sony came to Nintendo and wanted to make a disk drive for their... I don't remember if it was for the Super Nintendo or the N64. But essentially, they had plans to create a disk-driven game console with Nintendo. Nintendo blew them off, so they went and made their own console, and it was, like, the most successful ever. <laughs> yeah, and me meanwhile, Nintendo went with Philips instead and made the worst Zelda and Mario games ever made. Yeah, so Nintendo so could they not have fucked up harder. The biggest <laughs> fuck-up of all time, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they basically, in that moment, gave up the game industry. Like, they somehow didn't recognize that discs would be the future, like, because they can... Not only can they hold more data than a cartridge, but you can have multiple discs and switch between them. Um, I don't know if maybe they... Because, like, this is also where we started having to need memory cards, was in the disc era. Um, I don't know if Nintendo just thought that would be too much. Like, they still saw gaming as, like, a, like it had to be accessible to everybody. Maybe they thought people wouldn't understand memory cards or discs or something. Um, I don't know what the fuck they were thinking. I think... I don't know what the... I mean, maybe it was, like... They're just used to the way it was, and, and that was fine. Um, but, like, I think they had memory cards, like a, a special pack you could put in the controller for an N64. N there was one, yeah. The Which, depending on the game, might require that. I don't know if they thought that would be the case when they launched, because it, it, it wasn't immediate, I don't think, but that did become a thing on the N64. Um, yeah, and it's funny how, like, Nintendo, their next console... They're still not that into CDs. That's why they're so small on yeah. the GameCube. They didn't. They didn't want to. They didn't want to have a full CD. They want a little baby one. And as soon as they could stop having CDs, they immediately did. With the now they've got the Switch, which is on like SD cards. Oh yeah. Like, I don't know what it is that they don't. I, I mean, I guess CDs have problems. They can get scratched up and you know fall apart. So they're, you know, they they don't stay, like, you can still have a fucking, you know, GBA games that are, that, that have been fucking left, individually, the cartridge left in a box for eight years, and it still works. If you do that with a CD, that CD is fucked. But, um, you know, uh, some people have more responsibility. I can't even claim that, like, kids know better, because I didn't know better. We destroyed a lot of, like, GameCube games and shit. <laughs> but, um... You know, I they was, were just really resistant. I mean, I don't know where I learned, but I was always very careful of, of CDs. I would I would really get upset whenever I would go to a friend's house and they, they uh, you know, had a habit of just taking the CD out and putting it not in the case immediately. Right. Like, I was, really, I was really anal retentive about that. And whenever my brothers would, like, fail to do that, I would, I would yell at them, like, you just can't do that. Can't put it on a surface, you fucking retard. Uh, it, not actually that important a lot of the time. You can just put it on a flat surface, but, uh, yeah. Well, you can, but then you run the enormous risk of spilling something on it, which, in my house, things were getting spilled constantly. So, like, any disc that sat out long enough, like, we would, I don't know what it is, me and my brothers all have this very specific brand of laziness where, like, a disc will get left out for months, you know? And, like, everyone sees it there, but no one wants to be the one to put it away, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And eventually, you know, the likelihood of it getting destroyed approaches absolute. I, so, I understand you know. that. Like, 
Like, I would, I would begrudgingly, if I wasn't the one who left it out, I would put it back in the case, but I would use that as an excuse to, to think really badly of, of everyone. <laughs> I would just be mad, like, ah, oh, man, I can't believe I have to do this, but I'm the good one, and I can, I have, I have, like, a, a license to call you a piece of shit no matter what you're doing. <laughs> so, if I remember correctly, on the previous show, your first console was the PS2, because um, no, you didn't it was realize the PS1. it was already- Okay. Uh, what was yeah? The I I it was really. Oh, I was like, thinking of the Game Boy that you yeah, yeah. you got the Game Boy Advanced when you thought you wanted the Game Boy. Yeah. Um. So when uh, did you get the PS One? I got the PS One. I have no idea when. It was for Christmas. It's it, my uncle had it, and he didn't understand it, so he gave it to me as a <laughs> as a gift with like Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone game, and ah, yes. uh, Rayman Two or something. Oh, no, no, I think it was just Harry Potter. And it was basically the Harry Potter machine for the first few weeks. And I love that game so much. So that was a very good introduction to it. And obviously Harry Potter was huge at the time. I was way into the books. It was like, Harry Potter was the first book I ever read. So that's, you yeah. know, a big thing. I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a wizard. I'm a wizard boy. So yeah, that was, that was my introduction to the console. And then um, I think from there... I think it was like near, kind of near the end of the PlayStation One's lifetime, uh, but I wouldn't know because I can't remember, you know, any sort of time dates yeah. and stuff. Well, the PS Two would have come out in like late two thousand, I think. So yeah, and, um, and the and the Harry yeah. Potter came out like two thousand, I think. Okay. The the movie did anyway. I mean, uh, you said the Philosopher's Stone game, right? That came yeah. out in two thousand one. So. Yeah, I think it the PS2 been. may have already been out by the time you got a PS1. Yeah, I, because I remember not getting a lot of games for it before we got the PS2. I think I got the PS2 in 2003, so it was like two years later. But uh, yeah, yes. So, would you say that you played more PS1 games like later in life than you actually had? Yeah, um, as a the kid? the there's a number of big ones like. Uh, I've never played Metal Gear Solid yet. I still I have it, but I haven't played it yet. Um, that's a that's going to be an important thing to note about this console is that it's kind of in a way before either of our time. Um, like, because I didn't have a PS One at all. I had an N sixty four. So like, it's not that it was completely before my time, but um, you know, the the, the stereotype about the N sixty four and and every Nintendo console from then on is that it was a baby game console. And that's fine for me because I was a baby, you know, (laughs) like I was a game like Metal Gear Solid was like way too advanced for me to understand. Um, There was a time my parents rented uh, Metal Gear Solid for the GameCube because they remade the first first game for the GameCube. And like we were just like we didn't even understand like what it was, you know, Um, even then. And that was years later. So, like, yeah, there's definitely going to be some big, important PS1 games that neither of us have played, such as Metal Gear Solid. But yeah. there's so many fucking games on this console that, like, there's no way we could have played every important game on the console, I think. I think I've played, I mean, the ones I care about, the important ones, like uh, the Crash Bandicoot and Spyro series. I didn't grow up with those. I didn't have those. Um, but I have since played them. I got them on the PS3 uh, virtual stuff. And they're pretty good. They're pretty great. I understand why that's a big thing. And then uh, there's Ape Escape, which is the fucking greatest ape catching simulator in the world. So you would have played uh, Spyro and Crash after the sequel, spiritual sequels. Uh, oh, uh, you mean like um, Jack Ratchet and, and Jack? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I don't know. I'm I'm trying to think because I did play games at friends' houses and at the the kids' club I mentioned before, where it was just like they used to have a Game Boy and then like one year they they suddenly had a PlayStation or an N64 or something, and then they had right. stuff on it. I'm like, whoa, shit! Like that that was my favorite club to go to because they would gradually increase uh, the games console library. Eventually, they got a GameCube, but then I was like way too old to go, and I was I was sad. Oh. But uh, yeah, I didn't. I I, pl- I think I played the Crash game before I had the PS2 and Jack. I think. I guess it, it's interesting to hear you um, 
describing it like that you you got into it so late and everything because so much of your YouTube content has been about the PS basically you've been a PS1 PS2 YouTuber um yeah. for the hypocrite and I'd love an explanation as to sort of why what about the PS1 um attracts you so much um it's it's odd I think oh yeah yeah if we're talking like what about the whole console it's um it's yeah. probably the cuz I it's not like I didn't play PS1 a lot I did play it it's just when the PS2 came along it was like whoa everything's better but there's something it's just so wonderful about the shittiness of the you know the the low polygon count and the wobbly textures and the vibrant colors of of PS1 games that is just like like if there was like a 60 fps 1080p uh, video game, but it looked like uh, Spyro 1, I would buy it. I would buy the collector's edition of it. I don't care what it is. Yeah. I just love that shit. <laughs> I, uh, the shaky textures is the hardest thing for me about the PS1. Like, I generally like the aesthetic of, like, the early, um, you know, 3D games, but... I didn't grow up with the PS1, I got it much later, and, like, when I go back to play those games and I see those, like, super wonky textures, because the N64 didn't have that problem. Like, the funny thing about the N64 versus the PS1 is that the N64 was the more powerful machine, however, because it used cartridges, developers didn't want to do it. Because, like, cartridges were more of a pain in the ass, they had a, had a more difficult infrastructure to work with, um, it couldn't hold as much data, you know, a game like Final Fantasy VII, which has three discs, like, there's a reason they switched to Sony instead of remaining with Nintendo, because up till that point, Final Fantasy was a Nintendo series, um, then suddenly it switches because Nintendo can't play the game, it doesn't have enough space, like, how many fucking cartridges would that have taken up, uh, and cartridges are more expensive to make than CDs, so, the PS1's biggest advantage was it had an insane number of games, Whereas the N sixty four, of course, languished because um, it you know it didn't it didn't have the access. So uh, you know, while uh, why the fuck was I talking about that? I lost you were track. About, of... You said something about wobbly textures, and you were going off right. That. that the N sixty four is more powerful. So I grew up with a system that, while it looked graphically similar to the PS one, it was more consistent. It didn't have that weird wobbliness that really off put me when I finally started playing PS1 games and was like, why do they look like that? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was probably just that it was the first 3D-ness I'd ever seen. I mean, I think I'd seen an N64 before, uh, but, you know, just having it in your home and playing it over and over, you, you get accustomed to whatever you're looking at. And I right. just, I just, you know, Tomb Raider and stuff, just walk running around places like that, Resident Evil 1, um, Hogs of War, uh, Army Men Land Sea and Air. They're 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 kind of like, I'm just I'm just looking at the the list of games. And I'm just saying them, but like I played these games a lot, and I just I grew accustomed to like, you know, it, I played them so much that uh, to the point where it was fun to just turn it on and not really play the game, but just look at stuff and t and, yeah. and turn the camera around and then notice that oh, if you turn the camera around at this specific point. This texture sort of glitches out. Isn't that fun? And I just, I just didn't. I never thought that was like a bad thing. I just thought it was cool. Yeah. Because it, you, it, it, the game and the the world, it was just, it was cool. It was in three D. I didn't know you could do it cleanly. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I don't know if I would have been able to tell the difference at the time. Like, I don't know if I would have noticed a a significant difference in the N sixty four and PS one graphics. I'd seen some PS one games at friends' houses. But, um, again, the impression I always had of the PS1 was that it was this more, like, uh, adult console. Like, not necessarily adult, but, like, it was darker. Like, the games I had seen people playing, um, tended to be, like, human characters who were more, like, grown and, like, in a dark world, whereas I was used to, like, these bright, poppy kids' games, which is funny because the PS1 also had those, um, which we will note, like, you're big into mascot platformers, the PS1 had those in spades, you know, we yeah. had Spyro and Crash, and the, they were goofy, fun things that kids could play, but, Ape Escape you know. and, and Croc and, and Sheepdog and Wolf, all these yeah. things. Which is why I think, uh, 
you know, people rag on Nintendo for being the the baby game console. I think the real problem was always just that they didn't also have the other games. You know, like that the PS One PS One had all the baby games. It just didn't. It also had other shit. You know, and yeah. I think it was probably a instrumental part of getting adults into video games I mean, in the nineties. I know? remember, like, I mean, the fact that my uncle was the one who had the PlayStation. He probably like bought a football game or something to play on it. Like that was a thing. There was a FIFA game. And it was yeah. like, hey, we can play football with a controller, and it's like a all the all the all the dads all over the world. They bought a P- yeah. PlayStation One. So suddenly, suddenly playing games was cool for them. Same thing was true here, but with American football, which of which there are like fifty games just on the PS One. Shit. Like, yeah, there's a shit ton of fucking. Because oftentimes with uh, sports games, they will keep releasing the new ones for the old console, like, well into the new console's life cycle. Like, they were still releasing FIFA games for the PS2, like, four years after the PS3 had come out. Ugh. It's uh, it's nuts. Because, cause, you know, for a lot of people, it's just the FIFA machine. And, you know, they don't want to buy the new one yet. Yeah, like, adults, they live longer, or they're, they're older, so, like, yeah. years fly by, they're like, oh, didn't didn't a console just come out? I've, I've already been using this one, I don't need to yeah. buy another one, like, <laughs> stupid. Now I feel like that. So, uh, tell me about some of your favorite PS1 games. I'm still um, going down the list, making sure I find everything I played. <laughs> I, I, well, I've talked about Rayman 1 on my channel. That was yeah. really d- uh, difficult, but that was a fun thing. Uh, there's Ape Escape, which is also fucking the best. Uh, right. so, s- Ape Escape, my experience with Ape Escape is entirely just watching you and Endless Jess play through it at uh, Radcon 2, which was a five-hour complete playthrough, and the game looked fucking awesome. Like, I had heard of this game, I knew things about it, but like actually witnessing it, I was like, man, this game is... This is like a legitimately amazing game, and I can't believe it doesn't come up more in like conversations about great uh, PS1 games. Yeah, it's it's weird that I think I think it's just because Japan uh, is has got a, there's a lot of Ape Escape games that are exclusive to Japan, and I guess yeah. it's because Ape Escape Two didn't sell that well or something. I'm I'm not even sure. I I haven't really looked into it. But it is a very, like, Japanese... It's huge in Japan for some reason, compared to, to everywhere mm. else. Weird. But that happens sometimes. I mean, maybe it's just... Maybe it was just too baby game for the audience of the PlayStation. It could have been. You know? I mean, it was... This is, like, sort of setting up for things like Halo to come out and be right. like, We love shooting! Oh my god, bullets! <laughs> and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, speaking of, uh, Driver 2, which, um, I never could, I could never play the game, but it's basically, like, my first, uh, GTA-esque experience, where you just get in a car, and you drive around, and you smash into other cars, and you can get out and steal cars and drive around, and there's, like, a free play mode where you can go and just drive, and if the cops kill you, you're, you're dead, and that's it, there's nothing, there's no money, there's no, there's no nothing, you just run and drive, that's good. That's what I like. <laughs> what's uh what's really striking me as I go through the PS1 uh library is just like how fucking many franchises that are still going started here. And I remember saying of the PS3 that like um up until up until recently, it felt like every new console was putting out like a, a whole new swath of IPs. And that the the PS4, the, like, this new generation is the first one where we're not getting that out the gate. Like, there hasn't been, like, all these brand new IPs that, that can survive a series into the future. Um, but, like, even, even on the PS2 and PS3, we had shitloads of sequels to PS1 games. Like, there's a lot of things that started here that have uh, continued on. Um, Such as... Such as, hold on, <laughs> <laughs> I've got way too many things. Um, the Atelier games, which I didn't even know there was one before the PS2, because I'd played Atelier Iris for the PS2. Um, Atelier Mary. I don't know if you're familiar with the Atelier games, but it's a uh, RPG. Not. It's like the epitome of like the low budget 
uh, JRPG that comes out literally every single year. Um, and I don't know who buys them because they mostly get ragged on by people, but like they they never stop. Um, there's always a new one out. Tenchu started on the PS1, Tenchu Stealth Assassins, which is a game where you play as ninjas, and um, it's a stealth game. I played the Xbox, like, remake of the PS1 game, which uh, was pretty fucking dope, but I'd rather talk about that in the Xbox. Tekken starts on the PS1. Oh, no, fuck. One of the biggest fighting game franchises that's, you know, Tekken 6 just came out. Uh, Soul Calibur, originally Soul Edge for the PS1. So another big fighting game franchise, um, you know, uh, I'll come up with more as we go, but, <laughs> oh, Resident Evil, obviously, big, big time franchise that's still going, uh, they keep re-releasing the classic games over and over again. You know what offends no, me? I can talk about I, Resident Evil I'm at the Evil store, oh, and on both out. the PS4 Whatever. and the Xbox One, you can buy... Like, a box copy, like, a full-blown, oh, no. like, as if it was for that console, Resident Evil 4. Resident Evil 4, a game from three console generations ago, is being sold in a box f by itself for the PS4 and Xbox 360 for, like, $30. Come the fuck on. Anyway, Resident Evil 1, though, uh, great game. Um, I've only played the... The remake for the GameCube, which uh, overhauled the graphics to be fucking beautiful. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. I, I I've only played the the PlayStation One version, and I haven't played it much. Um, but it I love it because I think that I don't know whether they changed the voice acting for like the later versions. I hope they did, but like the PlayStation One is like notorious. Uh, oh yeah, they, they notorious changed for the, the voice acting yeah, for the the terrible voice acting, which is just my favorite of all time. Um, and something about the controls of that, where it's really difficult to turn around, like, uh, in Tomb Raider, like, you have tank con uh, controls, like, moving left just rotates you, but in Resident Evil, it's just, like, it's it increased a lot for some reason, because, uh, you know, spooky, like, you can't turn around quickly enough to shoot a guy. Uh, yeah. I could never beat the game, it's too scary, I poop my pants every time. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Well, hey, you just brought up another big franchise that started on the PS1, fucking Tomb Raider. Fucking Tomb Raider, yes. Which yeah. I had, uh, for whatever reason, over the years, I had never been under the impression that Tomb Raider was, like, a great game. Like, the way it got talked about always seemed to be that it was just known for Lara Croft being hot. Um, and most of the later games, like on the PS2, I had always seen kind of middling reviews for like I, I just always kind of got the impression that people didn't consider it like a great gaming franchise um which is why the first one i played was the ps3 game but then um basically you and endless jess talking the game up so much made me finally go and uh try it out and it's it's great it's cool oh the first um, one you like it yeah yeah it's awesome um i've only played through like the first world or whatever, but, like, you know, the tank controls, like, I understand why people would probably have difficulty going back to that control scheme, but the game is designed around those controls. Like, yeah. if you could just run around freely the way you can in the PS3 game, in the original, it would totally break the game, because, like, most of the challenges are really simple. It's like, make this one jump. You know, but the controls are difficult enough that making that one jump takes practice, and you got to really know your way around the controller, like, and know how to move Lara around. But like, you know, like if you want to collect all the secret shit, it's just about how well do you know the fucking controls. Um, so, yeah, I think it makes sense for the game to have the controls that it does, and it's it's fun to play, and it's it's got a great yeah. sense of adventure. It holds up. A great sense of, of the unknown and the scary gorillas and T-Rexes and all that. Yeah. And the shooting them and the shooting the bats. Oh, I love shooting bats. That's good. Yeah. That's a good game. I, I, a really, game that... I really want to play like the, the second and third games, but I feel... I don't know whether you feel this, but whenever there's, mm. a, fr there's a series or a franchise that has numbers, um, I always feel like I can't beat or start the second one until I beat the first one. I am similar. I mm, I won't say it has to be, like, that harsh, but, like, 
I will often want to beat, like, for instance, the Persona games. I've only beaten the second one, and I've never played the first one because it's not as easily available on any console that I care about. But, like, um, the first one I had played was Persona 3, and I don't feel like I can play 4 or 5 until I beat 3. Because 3 was great. Like, the, what I played of it was really good. So I would feel like if I move on to 4 and 5, will I ever get back to 3, you know? Um, so, like, yeah, it, it's kind of like a, a weight on my mind. Especially because the newer ones are probably easier to play, probably a little bit more modernized and, like, you know, build on what the third one did. But I th- yeah, I yeah. I think of it like like a like I'm a like I'm a Boy Scout and I'm I need my badge, my Tomb yeah. Raider badge to get my second Tomb Raider badge, like a little yeah. little little added like um the stripes, you know, like the military yeah. guys they have the triangles. I don't know what they yeah, fucking. I was add. a I was a Boy Scout, so I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Well, I was a Cub Scout. It didn't last long as an actual Boy Scout, but, you know. Um, yeah, I'm almost done going down the list of PS1 games. It's just, it's it's insanely massive, and again, there's lots of them that I never got to play. But uh, Tomb Raider, I've gotten to play a little bit. Um, I played it on the computer, like, with the DOS box that I had to install for the Steam version. Fucking sucks. Tony oh. Hawk started on this console. Oh, of course, yes. I didn't um, play those, but those lo- those always looked fun. Like I only fun. played them on N64. The only experience I have with the PS1 versions is that um, Jesse played them all at my house. Uh, and, yeah, I I guess I would rather talk about this if we do an N64 episode. <laughs> all right. I, I haven't played them, so, yeah, that'll be fine then. Yeah. Um, fucking uh, Disney games. Disney games on the PlayStation, uh, A Bug's Life, which... Uh, the Bugs a Bugs Life was like my introduction to movies and 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 mm. liking and 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 being excited for a movie to come out. I saw a billboard for for Bugs Life and I thought I want it. I don't know why, but uh yeah, and we got it and I love it and it was my favorite movie of all time. And then there was a game and I could be the bug. I could be the guy in 3D just like the movie which was 3D animated. It felt so good. Uh, going back to it, it's okay, but uh, really atmospheric and great music. Th- th- thing with Disney games, I don't know why. I mean, I, I do know why. They they paid money. Um, but the music <laughs> is fucking great. Every single Disney game has a perfect soundtrack, which is really catchy and great, and they... Yeah. Fucking yeah. Bugs Life is great. And also Disney's Hercules, which is um, I've, like I've, a side-scroller. I played the Bugs Life game on N64 as well. There was a, this was a one of the first I want to say this was like the first console generation to have like shitloads of crossover. Actually, maybe that that's not true cuz Super Nintendo and Genesis had had games that came out for both, but like there was a lot of shared library, I think. I feel like uh, it may have been the first time where the crossover was was like basically the same thing. Like Genesis and Super Nintendo games tended to be like very different looking from each other. Yeah. And then and then the 3D models they could probably just copy them over without too right. much change from N64 to PlayStation. Um by the way a a a whole company that got their start on the PS1 that's quite important from software with oh. the uh Kingsfield games started on the PS1 which I don't know if you've played any of them they're impossible. <laughs> oh, did did Jesse play one of those? Yeah, at, he did. Yeah, he, it was like Kingsfield Two, and we had no fucking idea what was going it on. It looked like, terrifying. Yeah, it's quite it's quite complicated. And then you got Armored Core, which also began here, um, which those games are also insanely fucking hard. Everything from software has ever made has been insanely fucking hard. Um, but yeah, they would later go on to make the Souls, the uh, the Dark what's it Dark Demon Blood Dark series? Demon Blood. Yeah, Dark Demon Blood as you call it. Uh, so, to get into my history with the PS1, which I haven't even really started on yet, um, I got it... I didn't have it at all until, like, 2005, I want to say. So, like, well into the PS2's life, um, I was way into RPGs. Like, I was a big RPG guy at the time. I had tons of PS2 RPGs, um, and I had always wanted to be, like, a big Final Fantasy guy. And there was a period where I was trying to play through um, Final Fantasy games, or, or, or I was just playing RPGs all the time, but my PS2 broke right as we moved into the ghetto and we didn't have any money. So, like, we, we couldn't afford to buy a new PS2. And at one point, we found a PS1, like, for cheap at some 
game store and uh, picked it up. And basically, for me, it was a Final Fantasy machine. I bought Final Fantasy 7, 8, and 9, and Tactics, and I want to say the collection that had, like, 5 and 6 on it. So, like, yeah, that was my whole purpose with it, was to play Final Fantasy. And I never beat any of them. I got towards the end of disc one of Final Fantasy VII and then just kind of never got around to playing more of it. Like, I'd gotten to a point in the game where it's it's really opened up and it kind of encourages you to, like, go back and maybe grind a little before you get into, like, the big final dungeon of the first disc. Um, which, the end of the first disc is where the big plot twist everybody knows about happens, but I never got to see it. So, yeah, like, I played most of Final Fantasy VII, which is a great game. I love the aesthetic of Final Fantasy VII. The background art is really gorgeous. Um, it was a really huge surprise for me that the whole game doesn't take place in the the big city. The, uh, I don't remember what it's called. Midgar. Um, Midgar. That, like... Like, I thought the whole game was set there, and then when you leave, like, relatively early and it becomes, like, a Final Fantasy game, I was like, oh, this is like the other ones, <laughs> you know? Um, that was a big shock, but it was a pretty um, pretty fun time. Final Fantasy VIII I had not liked at all, because that game's very moody and emo, and I really hated the way that the graphics look in it, because... Final Fantasy VII put these really doofy-looking, very simplistic, uh, sp- like, um, 3D models onto a 2D background. And the game's been criticized a lot for that, but it it's surprising how well it does hold up. Like, when you play it, that kind of seeps into the background. You're not constantly noticing it. And the way they animate those 3D models is really fun, as you pointed out in your uh, GRPJ on the game. Yeah. Um, Final Fantasy VIII decided to try and have, like, just really large sprites for the characters that would fit into the world better, but they just kind of look like dog shit. So I really hated the look of Final Fantasy VIII at the time. Was it sort of um, like um, the their battle sprites or uh, models were the same as their walking around models? Um, they, they were... Because during... they were, like, tall and not, like, squashed. Yeah, like... But but when you were on the world map, it would have, like, this super pulled-out perspective, and your guy would be, like, tiny and look like just a blob of pixels. Like, I really hated the way it looked on the world map. I don't know. I haven't played this game in a very long time. I just remember thinking I didn't like the look or feel of it. Like, I didn't like the story, and uh, and that's, you know, integral to enjoying a Final Fantasy game. Final Fantasy IX, meanwhile, I was really into. I got to disc three out of, I think, four... And um, and then I trapped myself by fucking making a huge mistake. But that game's beautiful. The background art is, like, this really gorgeous high fantasy. The character models look great in that game. The story is really fun and interesting. All the characters are very lovable. So, yeah, Final Fantasy IX was definitely my favorite Final Fantasy. Um, I owned Final Fantasy Tactics, but I never played, like any of it. I think I fired it up one time, got through a couple cutscenes, and then realized I wasn't in the mood, or that it was going to be hard and I didn't want to play it. So yeah, that was what it initially was for me. It's just, this is my Final Fantasy machine. Um, But I also owned one other PS1 game before I even bought the PS1, because the PS2 could play PS1 games. The only reason I bought a PS1 is because my PS2 was broken. Um, So we'd had a few PS1 games including uh, a Beyblade game that my brother Shade had, which uh, I think we talked about on the previous podcast. Well, I um, talked about a Beyblade on GBA. Yeah, and then I mentioned that the PS1 game is like just literally what it would be in real life. Like, you just yeah. rip the things and they, they go into an arena and fight. Um, and then I also had an Inuyasha fighting game called Inuyasha A Feudal Fairy Tale, which is not good, And it's also, like, it's one of those fighting games where when you try to play story mode, you can't even beat, like, the first fucking guy because it's just too hard. Um, Or at least I didn't understand how to play. But, yeah, I still have this. I have an Inuyasha fighting game for the PS1. Um, Didn't play it that much, but it's good. I love that it exists. And I think we also had Soul Reaver, though, like, Shade had bought it for, like, cheap in some bargain bin, and it didn't actually work. Like... Um, and that, that also became a franchise, the Legacy of Kane and Soul Reaver uh, games, which I later played Soul Reaver on an emulator and got like five hours in and just kind of lost interest in it. But 
you know, it's known for its uh, epic storyline and all that. Hey, pass yeah. the baton back to you if you want to talk about another game. Well, uh, I have a pretty important game uh, to mm -hmm. talk about, a uh, Rugrats Studio Tour, which oh is my Lord. is uh, surprisingly engrossing. I want to make a video about it eventually. Uh, it's it's I mean it's obviously terrible because it's Rugrats, but the the other the other Rugrats game like Rugrats in Reptile Land or something. Uh, that does suck, because that's just a bunch of mini-games in a terrible theme park. But, uh, Rugrats Studio Tour is like the Rugrats are in... They're, they're in a TV studio, and, uh, Dill locks himself behind a door that needs 50 keys, and you have to go oh, wow. around to all the different themed zones, the cowboy zone, the space zone, and you gotta do a bunch of stupid... Like, uh, uh, you gotta do so much shit. You gotta do, uh, car racing. You gotta do treasure hunting in the pirate zone. You gotta do, uh, alien invaders. You gotta do, uh, like, fucking... There's lots of stuff. You gotta get all the keys. But the thing that I remember so much is the, the creepy clown, uh, that, uh, makes, like, a scary noise when you get closer to it. Um... In the pirate zone and in the space zone, if you walk, if you're walking around looking for stuff, the the the, the creepy clown is like a like a wind up toy, and it goes eh, 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 eh. I mean, scarier than that, but like um, the it, it gets really loud. Like it's it's one of those weird sound design choices where, even though it's like kind of far away from you, it will be blowing out your speakers, uh, and blowing out the music because it's getting, <laughs> and you can get even louder, and it's just like. It is scarier than Resident Evil. I remember pooping my pants twice as much playing r uh, Rugrats. Uh, and, uh, yeah. This is, this is fucking great. Another game franchise that started on the PS1, Guilty Gear. Big one for me. I'm a huge Guilty Gear fan, though I never played the uh, the PS1 games. As like I'm, I, I've gone through all the PS1 games in the list, and like pretty much all the ones that I like know of I haven't really played and if I have I played it on a different console or like the sequel or something um yeah but I can get into games that I played uh a bit later there's a few that I borrowed from uh a friend such as Xeno Gears which I played like the first hour of and it seemed cool and it's like one of the famous big famous RPGs and I never played past that um, Chrono Cross, similarly, I played a few hours, which, Chrono Cross is fucking beautiful, the background art is really incredible in this game, I think it's probably one of the better looking, uh, PS1 RPGs, but again, I just didn't play that much of it, I know some, I, I, I know of some people who are huge, huge fans of it, um, I think those are all the ones that I played by loan, but I've got a bunch of stuff I've played on emulator, such as Doom for the PS1, which oh, Doom yeah. is on everything, but the PS1 version is interesting because it's got like this really dark, foreboding soundtrack because they, you know, they didn't use the licensed, uh, or the, the rather not non-licensed uh, fake versions of Metallica songs that the original Doom had. Um, they crafted a much more, like, intense feel with the PS1 game. But uh, that's the version of Doom I've played the most of, I think. Uh, um, I'm thinking of, like... Because, like, I I've basically gone through most of the games on the list that I have really anything to say about. I mean, there's there's Army Men Land, Sea, and Air, which um, is, is a war game, and it's a gritty war game, but it's plastic army men. So you're the green mm -hmm. plastic army men, and you're fighting the tan plastic army men, and it's really, really difficult. And there's, uh, in the, it, when you're in the field, like it's all realistic, which is kind of cute. Like you're obviously fake, and there's no blood. And when you get shot, your your little icon like shows bits of plastic getting blown off. Um, cool. But uh, like the the environment is like it's got lots of uh, like birds chirping and and you know uh, footsteps and no music. It's just like this is what it would be like if green sol uh, plastic soldiers were real. And they fought in actual wars with bullets. <laughs> and, like, the explosions were, like, really huge and scary. The tanks... Oh, my God, the tanks. Jesus Christ. That's a good game. Yeah. But, like, um... I guess I could go more into Spyro and Crash. But, like, well, I didn't you... actually have a lot of games on yeah. the PlayStation 1. I've basically gone over, like, the, the main, the main stuff. Before you go into Spyro and Crash, did you ever play yet another um, very important... PS1 game, Castlevania Symphony of the Night. 
I didn't. I I don't think I'd even heard of it until the internet. Yeah, it's it's. I, I hadn't either. This is one that I caught on late that it was like supposed to be a classic or whatever, and um, I played a few hours of it at a time where I was like on a big Castlevania kick. This was probably like post sequelitis getting really interested in Castlevania because he had talked about it so much. And, uh, like, I played through most of Castlevania's, like, 1 and 3, which I really liked. And, um, Symphony of the Night, while it's a it's a really nice-looking game and it's, you know, controls well and stuff, it is very much like the beginning of the end for Castlevania going down in the direction. Like, like the whole point of the Castlevania 1 versus 2 video was he was saying, like, Castlevania 2 is the one that really feels like the modern games. And while those games are fun because they have really cool visuals and, and sound effects and stuff, like, they are not the tightly constructed platforming action games that the the first, third, and to some extent the fourth game are, you know? And, like, I really liked the early games a lot more than what Castlevania became. So for me, playing Symphony of the Night, it was just kind of like seeing all that stuff that I didn't want to see in the series. Um, but I still would like to play through it sometime, because, like, even the weaker Castlevania games, in terms of, like, like the mm, mm, conceptually weaker, I guess, is the word I want to use, uh, are still good. You know, they're still fun Could games. Could you imagine if if Kirby became, like, a like a s- sprawling RPG, like, a Egovania sort of game, instead of the platforming challenge that it's, it's always um, been? The funny thing about Kirby is that it's had moments almost like that. Like, Kirby and the Amazing Mirror is a game that's sort of structured almost Metroidvania-esque, where, like, it's kind of like an open world, and you just go around... Like, it's open world... It's like a 2D game, but, like, there's all these mirrors that lead to different, like, level stretches, but you can just go back through them all the time. Like, um, I don't know. I only played a bit of Kirby and the Amazing Mirror, but I was very confused when I played it. I was like, what in the fuck is the structure of this game? Um, I'm really just trying to think of, like, platformers that have done this kind of or what the, what would be what it, like a Mario game like what would a Mario game be like if it hasn't already happened where it's like a platformer but with RPG elements and getting items and stuff in a big sprawling world yeah i mean the metroidvania egovania uh style has you know is huge now like there's tons of indie games that do it um hollow knight being the most recent example that everyone cites so yeah like um, I wouldn't be surprised if more franchises just, like, sort of somehow ended up there. That would be funny. I could see, like, a Rayman. <laughs> Rayman <laughs> Egovania or some shit. I think there's... Just, I've, I'm trying to remember. I know there's, like, one game that did that other than Castlevania, but I'm not sure which one it was, and I can't remember. Like, the game that, like, added in a leveling system suddenly. Um, I, I can't think it, of it. Well, you go ahead and tell me about something else. Um, well, I have here uh, written down shit tons of demo discs, and I oh. guess this means like um, this was a time when uh, you know a, a, a gaming magazine could have a demo disc uh, in a little sleeve uh, taped to the front of their magazine to get people to buy it. Uh, you couldn't do that with cartridges, so nope. I I I like demo discs. I like that. I remember playing this little Muppet Racers game. Don't know whether that actually is a game or not. There was a Splinter Cell demo, and some weird chicken game, and uh, like a, a preview for like Rayman uh, M or like Rayman Multiplayer Arena. I don't know what it's called in America, but that was gonna be a, that was a PlayStation One demo. It, was, it, it came out on the PlayStation Two later. Mm. I like I, there's something cool about demo discs. I really wish I had the old ones. I like them. What, what do you think of demos? I didn't have very many of them as a kid, but I loved the ones I did. Like, I didn't have any for the... I can't think of any, like, home console demo discs I had, other than, like, the Metal Gear Solid 2 demo that came with uh, Zone of the Enders, and the Halo 3 beta that came with uh, fucking Crackdown on the Xbox 360. But, like, um, yeah, I didn't have enough of them, but I would have loved them, because I love playing i'm a big fan of playing like random five minute of game you know so like it would have definitely been something i got into had i not been in a nintendo boy <laughs> where the, they didn't do that shit 
Oh um, shit! I think I think one of those demos had like a Silent Hill thing. Is that like a franchise that's still going? Or is uh, that yeah, dead? there are still. There's been one not too long ago, I think. Um. Yes. Where are you going? Where is he going? I don't want to have to edit this episode. <laughs> Hippo. Hippo has gone to another world. Well, I'm going to talk about a couple of games that I've never actually played for myself, but that I've watched being played. Uh, Hippo, are you back yet? Let me know when I'm you're back. back. Okay. I'm back. I'm going to talk about a couple of games that I only know because of Endless Jess. Um, one, and, and this is part of what I love about the uh, PS1 and PS2 era and like all those older games, is that... There were so many games that sometimes you just, like, stumbled dick first into a weird gem that, like, you never would have imagined was there. Or, like, not even a gem necessarily, but just something that, like, uh, no one would talk about. Such as Hello oh, Kitty's Hello Cube Ki Frenzy. Yeah. yeah, like, um, which is one of my favorite uh, Endless Chess videos is his Hello Kitty's Cube Frenzy video because it's just about how, like, he found some random Hello Kitty game and picked it up because why not and played it for, like, five minutes and had a smile and it, he's just glad to know it exists, you know? And, like, yeah, it's an interesting, like, game. It's got a really weird mechanic I've never seen anywhere else in a fucking Hello Kitty game, you know? Which apparently, I I'm looking at the page and it was originally a Game Boy Color game. Or it was on it was huh. on both Game Boy Color and PlayStation. I think they might have been at the same time. But um, I think this might have been like because it's CDs. It might have been like the gateway for like lots of uh, companies to get their their branding into a video game form because that's like the hot yeah. new thing. And cartridges are a bit big of it. Like you need to know a bit more. But right. like companies sprung up like oh yeah we're just gonna make. We're just gonna make games for for you know this company and that company and then think uh, what am I thinking of like branding, uh, right. IPs, various unrelated stuff. Yeah, it's I'd just say like, this is the era where it became accessible for there to be a million games. Like you're not gonna get a fucking Hello Kitty game on the PS4, like unless it's a free to play game that's like just somewhere, you know, in the shop, like, the online shop. Like, they're not going to make a disc game for that. And there was just so many more games in the market for the PS1 and PS2. Another one I had never heard of until Jesse was Skull Monkeys, which is a very oh, fascinating yeah. uh, claymation game, uh, side-scrolling platformer that has a, a scatological sense of humor. Um, I wish I had been there while you were recording that, because that looked so cool. Yeah, it's a very, very interesting style. It was me and Jesse and Ben, um, me, or me and Ben watching Jesse do a, a playthrough of it, which is only three hours long, but it's a very interesting game. Um, after that, all I have to rattle through is some, um, some games I've played on emulators. I briefly played the Vampire Hunter D game, but it sucked. Um, two games I played because they were action RPGs, and I, I'm a big action RPG guy. One is Valkyrie Profile, which I sort of knew as this... It's sort of famous for how rare it is. Like, Valkyrie Profile is a PS1, um, you know, uh, RPG, like a big epic RPG that was not in circulation for very long. And by the time I even found out about it in, like, 04, it was $70. So, like... It was famously hard to come by, which made me, in my head, interpret it as, like, it's, the like, one of the greatest games, you know, because why, why else would it be so expensive? But it's got a very unique combat system where um, it's sort of like an integration of turn-based and active combat in a side-scrolling uh, setup, and, like, the whole game is side-scrolling. Um, like, it's a big RPG, but all of it's in 2D, and uh, they're, they're sort of... I think people who love this game, there's sort of a renaissance of them popping up making their own games. Indivisible is hugely influenced by it, uh, which is a Kickstarter game. And there's, like, I've seen other games popping up in, like, the Steam and PS4 library that look like Valkyrie Profile. So I don't know why it's suddenly having an influence, but um, the game's pretty dope. And then there's Brave Fencer Musashi, which is another sort of popular... Um, like uh, it's it's often considered like one of the buried treasures of the PS1, a um, action RPG that's much more focused on the action side. I would consider it sort of like 
uh, a 3D platformer combined with an action RPG that's very spectacle driven. Like it's a it's a very linear game, and it's all about like variety and different stuff happening. So um, I would almost say this is like the precursor to something like a God of War, where like it's got kind of got an RPG upgrade system, but it's mostly about combat and like set pieces. And Brave Fencer Musashi is similar in that way, very set piece driven. Um, I wasn't that into it. I only played a few hours, but I know a lot of people really like it. And the last game I want to talk about is Ghost in the Shell. Ghost in the Shell had a PS1 oh. game that's fucking great. And uh, you play as a little robot, a little tank robot, the Fuchikoma. And, like, you can walk on all surfaces. You can walk on walls, on ceilings, on, like, whatever. You just walk around with this tank and you shoot bullets out of your front and, like, destroy other robots and, like, planes and stuff. Like, it... It's just, it's almost weird that there's not another game with this exact control scheme. Like, it feels so right that as soon as I started playing it, I was like, oh my god, this is like a really unique, interesting, cool game. Um, the only reason I haven't beaten it is that it doesn't quite work right with the emulator, at least the one I was using. Um, like, it would, when I got to level 2, like, there'd be these night vision segments, and when you use the night vision, it just completely glitches out the, the emulator, so, yeah, um... Otherwise, though, I would definitely seek that game out. I might even, if I ever feel like throwing down an absorbent amount of money for a video game, I'll probably buy a physical copy of it. You know, like hearing, the, 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 I think the fact that the PlayStation has such limitations, I was able to, like, imagine what that looked like. And mm -hmm. just just from the imagination, because, like, like, NES games, they, they, can, they can range quite quite drastically from you know, how good yeah. the graphics are, because it's just pixels. But, like, uh, models, they can only be so uh, advanced on the PlayStation 1. Right. So I'm just thinking about what that looked like, and I just love it immediately, just in my head. That reminds me, um, it's it's kind of interesting, the, the difference between, I think, what you like the most about the PS1's graphics and what I like the most, because you really like the wonky early 3D CG graphics, I was big in, um, like, my big discovery with the PS1 was how fucking great the 2D graphics and pixel art were, um, because I'm huge into pixel art. I love, like, giant detailed pixel art images and, like, and big sprites that are well animated, and one of the biggest advantages of the PS1 was that even though, yeah, you could have 3D, you could also have way better 2D art than was ever possible on previous consoles, and it was kind of lost going forward, like... The N64 didn't even really bother with, like, pixel art games, um, so I didn't even know they were a thing until, like, later. Um, and then you have, like, the PS2 and, like, that era, and by that point, no one was doing it anymore, like, except maybe oh, yeah. Nippon Ichi. Like, yeah, even, even, even things like Rayman on PlayStation 1 was, like, pixel art and it looks really mm -hmm. nice. It's, like, it's like a little step up from the SNES, it, like, it's... Right. But a yeah, they didn't do up, that I anymore. Like, but but if they did do stuff like that, it would be like um, it it's dated because it's not pixely. It's it's got yeah. they've got too many pixels to work with. So like the edges are sort of like uh, what do you call it? Like uh, airbrushed. Yeah. Like that everything's sort of fluffy looking. And the like the um. The pre-rendered backgrounds were always gorgeous. Like, Final Fantasy VII's backgrounds are fucking yeah. incredible, you know? Um, Chrono Cross, once again. And Valkyrie Profile, like, the what attracted me to that game was how beautiful the artwork is. And I looked at it and I went, like, this is better looking than most modern games. Because it's just use like, it's 2D, so it doesn't have to be as, like, ridiculously expensive as it would be to make, like, a, a 3D game look that good. But, um... You know, but it's using the full power. Like, it's as good as 2D can be because it's on a console that can handle as much graphics as you can put into it, you know, um, at least in, in 2D terms. Like, pretty much from that point forward is where 2D games got really incredible looking, but also where they waned in popularity. And it's only now in the PC era that they're making a huge comeback. And we've gotten games like Hyperlight Drifter that's, like, the most fucking gorgeous pixel art I've ever seen, you know. And, like, I'm really excited that it's coming back, but I wish it was not just indie devs. Like, it's rare. I want to say the studio upholding it the most, like, the PS1 style of 2D graphics is Vanillaware, the company who makes um, uh, Muramasa the Demon Blade and Odin Sphere 
and Dragon's Crown. Like, they're the last bastion of, like, what the PS1 could have done with with uh, 2D graphics going forward. I... I might want to have like a like a podcast just talking about pixel art because I don't agree with you about Hyperlight Drifter, um, yeah. specifically. But we can save that for another time. I I'm extremely curious. I love <laughs> the aesthetic of that game. Like it's the color palette is perfect. Well, but... if you want to talk about it now, we could. Uh, no, it's not relevant. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> tell me anything else you have to say about PS One and All its right. games. Uh, I have one game. Um. But I didn't play much. I, w- I played it at my cousin's house because uh, they were into it, and they they had Ape Escape and a WWF SmackDown or, or something. Um, and they wanted me. They wanted to play against me. I think what they wanted was they wanted to play against their little cousin who sucks and would mm-hmm. lose um, at <laughs> wrestling because they they pr- they obviously played against each other all the time. And there's like, oh, there's this little baby br- little baby boy here. Let's have him play. And see what he does, and laugh at him. Um, but I, I was, ju- I was enamored with Ape Escape, and I kept asking to play that instead. Um, <laughs> but w- the wrestling, like looking back, is actually quite nostalgic, just because of the fact that I had to play that if I wanted to play Ape Escape. How many games do you have that, like, you watched someone else play it, and even though you're not even sure if it would be your kind of game, like you've got this longing sense in your mind, like I need to go back and play that one day. Because, like, for me, uh, that's there's a game called Parasite Eve on the PS1, which is a very... It's an RPG, like a Square Enix RPG, but with a totally different feel and aesthetic. Because it's, like, a urban horror game. Like, it takes place in the modern world and is horror-themed, but it's an RPG. And um, I had... Like, a friend of mine had the game, and I'd watched them play it for, like, five minutes and was like, what in the fuck is this? And... That image was really seared into my mind, and then Happy Video Game Nerd did a video on it one time, and I was like, oh, this looks so interesting, and, like, even though I don't think I'd ever get around to it, there's, like, a part of my brain that's saying, like, you have to, because you know about it. You've known about it since you were a kid, you know? Yeah, I I don't think there's any games like that on the PlayStation 1. There are other games, but it's mostly, I think, because I was the eldest, I, I, I still am, the eldest brother. But at the time, my younger brothers, they didn't really play the games that well. And when we got the new consoles, then they started playing games themselves more. Right. And then I would watch them play, like, certain things. And, and yeah. But not not on the PlayStation 1, aside from the wrestling thing. Because I don't think I really know what... Like, I, I, I at one time, I tried to look up what wrestling game it was. And there's, like, five or six ones that look exactly the same. And I couldn't tell which one it yeah. was that I played. <laughs> yeah, uh... By the way, PS1, I think, is one of the first consoles to have uh, multiple iterations. And more importantly, iterations on the controller, which was a big, a oh, big yeah. change. Cause, and I didn't even know this until much later, that the original PS1 controller just had a D-pad. Um, there was no joysticks on it. Yeah, I think I still have one of those. And then at some point, they introduced the DualShock, which is the, the double joystick controller, and changed gaming forever! Because yeah, you know, um, you can now have precision control over 3D movement, and uh, yeah, it's a dope controller. And then they also had the P, like the original was the PlayStation, and then there's also the PS One, which was the remade version of the console. That, oh yeah, the little the little white one. Yeah, I'm not sure what the significant difference is between the two. I think it was just to make kids jealous. Because as soon as I, my friend had <laughs> one, I was like. That's so much. It's, it's it's white, therefore it's cleaner than the gray one. Uh, it's small and sleek, and it's not grubby from years of use. Damn it, I want it. But the PlayStation Two is already out, so I don't care. Yeah, and uh, it it also PS One was the first console, at least that I remember, that I think could play CDs. Yeah, I believe it could play. Oh C- yeah, yeah. There, there was like a CDs. menu thing you could put the CD in and listen to stuff. Yeah, which I know that gradually became a big selling point for consoles was that they could be used for other... Sh- like, I didn't understand at the time, like, why would I want to use my PS1 to play CDs when I have a CD player in my house? But then when the PS2 came along and it had a DVD player in it, it was like, hmm, you know, my parents have a DVD player that they use in the in the living room, but, like, I've got all these anime DVDs, so... um 
I believe the way I broke my first PS2 was that I played too many DVDs on it, and uh, apparently that's potentially bad. Uh, that's just like what I what I read at the time. I don't know how fucking accurate that is, but uh, yeah, that was that was my impression. Was oh god, I played so many anime DVDs, I broke my PS2. <laughs> Oh man, that's that's quite aesthetic. No. <laughs> so that's all I've got yeah. to say about the PS1. Not a console I had enough experience with. I feel like we're both a little a little after the time of the console and um you know, I'm sure it's weird for some people to hear a PS1 podcast that never mentions Metal Gear Solid except in passing, but hey, we played what we played. Yeah. I mean I've seen people play Metal Gear Solid. I've seen my brother play it, so yeah. I I get it. There's a bit with a bazooka that's kind of difficult. You got to shoot it through the holes. Yeah. I watched Matthew so, Matosis's video about it, so I know oh, yeah. everything that happens in the game. It's 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 funny because like I people do sometimes think of me as a PlayStation One guy, and I'm I'm not really. It was just sort of I I know about it. I know a lot about the the big ones. Right. But, yeah. It's more that you've got, like, a thing for, like, mascot platformers and early 3D graphics that you've represented yeah. in your videos extensively. Well, that's it, everybody. Uh, what fucking console should we cover on the next show? Uh, what have we... Have we done the uh, GameCube? No, we have not done the GameCube, and that would be a big one for me, so... All right. I've got a quite a few as well I can talk about. All right, sick. Join us next time for the GameCube. Yeah. Yeah. A GameCube. It's a cube that plays games. <laughs> <laughs>